the Soviet Union has a problem. While they are surrounded by America and their allies, they themselves can't reach the continental USA. The Atlantic is too large, and any attempt to move an invasion across it, be it by sea or air, would be detected and destroyed. But what if there was another way? by using submarines. But not just any submarines, but insanely over-the-top science fiction level monsters that if built would dwarf even the largest machines ever built. These sea monsters could carry everything from aircraft, battalions of troops, and even tens of tanks at once. Undetectable and immune to naval blockade, this was to be the ace in the hole for winning the Cold War. And believe it or not, the Soviets even started construction of a fleet of them with plans to use them to capture Western air bases in the Arctic Circle by surprise before an invasion of the North American coast. Let's dive deep into the nightmare of the West, the insane history of the USSR's giant amphibious assault submarines. This tale begins deep into the Second World War. The Soviet Union discovered that using submarines to shuttle weapons, supplies and special forces into besieged areas or behind enemy lines in World War II, specifically during the siege of Sevastopol, proved to be a game changer against the Nazis. The ability to keep the supply line hidden from surface weapons and operate with near secrecy gave an upper hand to the defenders and in no small part turned the tide of war in their favor. This submarine project is like a long lost distant cousin of the Russian submarines that they have built in the past, some that are the biggest in the world. Making this video a project that might have been lost to time unless we did hours of research to find them again. Something that you don't have to actually do anymore when you look up your own long lost family history. And to do just that, I partnered with MyHeritage to find my own family history and discover just how famous the Found and Explained family tree really is. And it works really well. I literally put in just one grandparent and then MyHeritage was able to trace me back six generations thanks to instant discoveries to Limerick Island. Meaning now that all my videos will have an Irish accent instead of an Australian one. I, I apologize greatly to any Irish people that were listening. I also found out that my distant family grew up in the wild Australian countryside and apparently how much of a playboy my great grandfather was. What's crazy that even if you don't know your own family history, my heritage has access to 19 billion records, meaning I was able to discover cousins and family that I didn't even know I had. If you want to go on your own family journey, MyHeritage is partnering up with us to offer a 14 day free trial with the link down in the description. It's a lot of fun and I would love to know what you find. Thus, in the spirit of victory in 1948, the USSR got serious on large submarines. The idea was that submarines could carry far more than just supplies for a bunkered down surrounded unit, but rather an actual force to defend or invade during times of war. This first project was dubbed Project 621. It was proposed as a landing ship transport submarine that could set down troops behind enemy lines. With some 5,950 tons of displacement, the underwater giant would have been one of the largest submarines of the day. The maximum surface speed was approximately 15 knots and 8.4 knots maximum underwater with a range on the surface of around 6,000 miles. The Soviets would turn to steam gas turbines to be their power plant of choice since in comparison with other options this ensured the greatest submerged endurance range. Again you've got to keep in mind this is before nuclear power was available. On its two vehicle decks, it was to carry a full infantry battalion of 745 troops, 10 T-35 tanks, 12 trucks, 12 towed cannons, and three catapult-launched LA-5 fighter aircraft for air cover. Yes, this was also technically an aircraft carrier submarine. Now, I can see you already asking in the comments, how did they unload this force? 
well, it acted just like a beach landing craft. The sub would approach the shoreline and come up unexpectedly, resting on the beach's bottom and filling the rear ballast tanks and tilting the front up. The troops and vehicles, meanwhile, would be unloaded over the bow ramp when the submarine breached on the surface. Talk about one heck of a surprise. Once unloaded, the sub would be much lighter and be able to refill with air into its tanks and then push off. But like all insane post-World War II ideas, there were two major flaws. The submarine didn't actually have enough room on board for the full infantry battalion to travel 6,000 miles. There was only one bunk bed for about every four people. Essentially hot bunking so hot that you could cook a dinner under the covers. And that exhaust system wasn't sufficient to have multiple machines active on the decks, especially during the vulnerable offloading period. You could imagine the fumes. So the USSR decided to go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. A submarine that would have the ability to travel through solid ice. The year is now 1952 and the race for the North is on. Both the USA and the USSR realized that the Arctic battlefield would be ruled by submarines and the concept of an amphibious assault submarine would be the edge that the Soviets would have against those dastardly capitalists. Called the Podledno Transport, which is Russian for under ice transport, Submarine Project 626 was started to deploy troops in the Arctic areas, as well as support air surveillance and communications in the Arctic Basin. At 348 tons and 100 meters long, this sub had the capacity to carry five tanks, necessary fuel and ammunition, as well as 165 crack commandos and their supplies for missions in the polar regions. But let's crack this bad boy open and have a look inside. You'll notice that right away that the submarine is actually quite tall and that it has a figure eight cross section of two main levels split into two compartments. Starting at the rear upper level, we have two torpedo tubes with four torpedoes making it capable to hold its own in a limited engagement. Directly underneath was the engine room that had two 2000 horsepower engines connected to one propeller to give it a speed on the surface of 12 knots or underwater up to eight knots. Moving forward, we also have a primary habitation and control room for mission operations and then the main cargo lift. Yes, unlike the previous Project 621 with the forward ramp, this version would have a lift in the middle that could move the tanks and troops up to the front of the con tower vertically so it didn't need to breach itself. And you're probably wondering why this design was chosen, because of its mission to operate in the ice. The idea was that the submarine could pop up anywhere at a moment's notice, surprising the Western forces. Its con tower would be heated to melt the ice up to four meters thick, and then the sub would surface only its top half, deploying troops and tanks, plus two paired P-25 anti-aircraft guns right in the middle of an enemy force, which is just plain cool. At the front, we have the main cargo hold with the armor or troops, and underneath are the main batteries. Additionally, a self-propelled mobile pontoon was securely fastened into the superstructure aft of the main command deck. The Soviets believed that they could use this submarine to capture allied airfields on the surface of the ice, which could then refuel Soviet bombers for further bombing missions to America. Now, there was also one issue with this concept, power. The current technology made it slow and it was definitely fuel hungry. Luckily, a new power source had arrived on the scene, atomic. But you couldn't fit in a typical nuclear reactor into this small submarine. Should we back off? Should we play it safe? Nah, you think let's make it bigger. So they needed to go bigger. In August of 1967, the USSR began to work on their magnum opus, Project 717. This would be the ultimate strategic everything submarine, able to not only deploy forces anywhere in the globe, but to also create and deploy mines at a moment notice, and to go head to head with the enemy fleets. It was redesigned really as the jack of all trades. 
With a displacement of up to 11,000 tons, this submarine was to carry up to 20 amphibious tanks and BTR-60P armored personnel carriers, as well as 470 troops, with the vehicle stored in a double-deck hull contained to the both sides of the main hull, with all three having an outer shell, giving it a very unique cross-section. At the rear of the vessel, we also had the main reactors and engine room with plenty of storage for supplies for the invading force. Plus here there was also a special mine production facility that could build and deploy sea mines without surfacing to interrupt enemies' shipping. Moving forward, there was a living quarters and access to the twin cargo compartments. The con tower was also quite long, with AA cannons kept in sealable hermetical modules, and a special rescue chamber that could be used in the case of an emergency. But it's when we get to the front of the submarine that it gets even more insane. The vessel was designed to unload in the same way as the previous Project 621, with twin ramps on either side of the bow. There would be a special bow ballast in the middle that would allow it to make beach landings, as well as casually six torpedo tubes with 18 to 20 torpedoes. Oh, did I mention that it also had AA guns and surface-to-air missiles? Yes, this was a beast of a submarine and it was just missing nuclear ICBMs. But this is possibly one of the most complex submarines ever designed both in the east and west, and figuring out the engineering was a Herculean task in itself. The engineers built several 3D models that could be rearranged in their components, swapping them around to figure out the best configuration. The final model was also used in fluid dynamic tests, meaning that they had to pretty much make a mini version of this submarine. By March of 1972, the technical project was a wrap and construction was ready to begin. The plan was to create a series of five of these bad boys to have a mini fleet ready to challenge American dominance. But alas, the construction of submarine 717 never got the green light. The NSR, the one and only Soviet plant up for the task of building these colossal ships, was caught up in the Nuclear Polarity Agreement with the United States. This agreement limited the number of nuclear weapons or nuclear-powered military machines, including submarines, and thus the plant was under heavy scrutiny from the West. The Soviet Union decided to shift gears, focusing their limited nuclear allowance towards heavy missile submarines, such as the Typhoon, as a response to the US Trident program. And just like when we tried to build the submarines for Project 648 and 664, the spotlight shifted to strategic vehicles, leaving the dream of creating a massive amphibious transport submarine in the dust. While this was the end of the Soviet amphibious assault program, it wasn't the end of the idea. After all, what about the American attempts? While the US Navy dabbled in preliminary designs of submarine transports in the past, it never reached the scale of the ambitious Soviet design program. In the 1950s, a concept for a 10,000 ton submarine emerged, boasting dimensions of 220 meters long and a beam of 38 meters. This underwater behemoth was envisioned to accommodate 2,240 marines, deploying them through amphibious flying platforms, which wasn't specified in exactly how they were propulsed. Not much is actually known about this program, although I'd love to do a video if someone can secure me the top secret documents. But remember at the start of the video how I mentioned that America ruled the air over the Atlantic Ocean and that it would stop any Soviet invasion? Well, when it came to submarines, they also had that in mind as well, and designed, believe it or not, multiple aircraft carrier submarines. And the best part of this news is that the video on it is already on the channel and you can go watch it right now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out My Heritage and get that 14-day free trial to discover your own family tree. It's actually really fun to fill it out and actually figure out so much history that I didn't know that I had. And plus, you can feel warm and fuzzy for helping the channel.